and attend the discovery of Remnant. The discovery of Remnant is only really described to us in the original novel series, with William learning about the souls of the missing children being basically infused into the endoskeletons of the original five animatronics. He melts them down to make the fun times, but this is when his goal changes. Originally, he, from what we can tell with our limited information, was just killing for the sake of it. However, now he had a purpose. He wanted to find the key to eternal life, to immortality, whether it be to bring uh, maybe an extra child back or to keep himself in the land of the living. The moment William discovered Remnant, he totally changed his game plan. However, that's the importance to the FNAF story. To us, it could be when we discovered how Remnant was made in the Fazbear Frights books, when Dr. Phineas Taggart discovered that agony was the most powerful human emotion, and that the act of possessing something in the FNAF world was just your extreme agony latching onto a nearby object, which explains why it happened to the children, and then to William, which I'll talk about later on. And the nine missing children's incident. The missing children's incident is really what started the FNAF series, it's also a tongue twister. It's a mystery that we all gravitated towards when we started looking into the first game, and it's the incident that really popularized the series, aside from it being terrifying. The incident has gone down in history as one of the scariest and most convoluted things in recent years, with whole threads being dedicated to why or how it happened, along with how William got away with it since the suits were literally leaking body fluids like a rotting corpse would and no one checked them out. It's incredible how far the series has come from just that one moment, and it being the catalyst for everything else. That makes it pretty important and very deserving of our number 9 spot. And before we get any further, if you're enjoying this video or just like the FNAF content in general, be sure you're hitting that like button on this one and all the videos to come. It really helps us out and it lets us know what you want to see more of. And at 8, Scooping. The first scooping of the series was that of Elizabeth Afton, the Afton family daughter. The one that was probably going to make a lot of mistakes in high school and college, but at least she wouldn't have been as bad as her father. But then, she went and ignored him, resulting in her getting scooped by Baby and getting crushed crushed, thus possessing the animatronic, which is freaking terrifying to begin with, but I think that Scott was trying to teach his kids to listen to him, honestly. This event, while not the start of William's killing spree, is a pivotal moment in the series as well, because while he discovered the remnant already, now he had a personal stake in the matter. His kid had possessed an animatronic. And the key to life in this remnant was also the key to keeping his daughter alive, and making sure that she could live forever, even if he used her to kill Henry in FNAF World, but that's beside the point. Her scooping is also what we believe made Crying Child scared of the animatronic and the inspiration behind the Nightmare Animatronic's stomach mouths, which ended up coming into play during the Crying Child's death later in the timeline. Probably th the same week, if we're being honest. Also, the FNAF series is like three or four years old, younger than Skyrim. That's it. And at seven, Scooping 2, Electric Boogaloo. Michael Scooping, however, defined the next parts of the series as a whole. We learn that he's working to right his father's wrongs, and we think that he's been doing it the whole time, even though it could have been Henry. Check the link in the iCard for the theory on that. But Michael Scooping was different. Instead of him dying, we see him get filled with Ennard, and then used as a skin suit to walk around in the world. We see his skin rot, or bruise, as it turns purple, drawing enough attention that Ennard thinks it's a better idea to roam the sewers as a mess of animatronic parts, but then he lets us know that he's coming after his father, so much so that once he traps him in Pizzeria Simulator, he stays there to make sure the deed is done, but it's not, and Michael gave his life in order for his father's reign of terror to end, but is this the last time we've seen Michael, or is always coming back hereditary? Only time will tell. Maybe reincarnation is a thing in the FNAF series. It very well could be. Scott's just pulling things out at this point. And it's six, Spring Locked. In FNAF 3, we watch as William Afton tries to save his own skin. He knows the animatronics are alive and tries to save himself by dismantling them in an effort to make sure they won't be able to, you know, stuff him into a furry suit. But in this action, as we see in the 8-bit minigames, he ends up releasing the souls of the characters. Well, I guess technically they aren't released, they just appear in an astral form or something, since they'd still be possessing the suits because he needs to melt them down, but yeah. This scares William because, you know, five of his murder victims are staring him down like Chica in a hot slice of pizza, so he does the one thing that he could think of, try and scare them back. By getting into the Spring Bonnie suit he used to lure them away in the first place. This suit makes him feel powerful, it's a confidence booster, it makes him feel like he's in control. 
a weird way to express a dom kink, but okay, I'm not judging. However, he does this so fast and the room was so moist and wet that instead of scaring them, he gets himself snapped. The spring locks fail and the suit shoots plenty of tiny and large bits of endoskeleton metal into his body, causing him to collapse and convulse, oozing blood like the kids in their suits. But this causes so much hassle because now, 30 years later, when he is set free, he can still kill. He isn't the frail old man that he should be. He has the strength of the animatronic behind him, and he's gonna use it. Now we're doing number five, Bite of 83. The Bite of 83, not to be confused with the Bite of 87, is one of the most confusing moments in a timeline sense. Like, we know it happened in 1983, but what happened to the crying child after? Does William and Dee put him back together? Does he possess something? What happened to crying child? But this is an important moment too, because despite the confusion between 1987 and 1983, this would only drive William deeper into his madness, causing him to do unspeakable and unexpected things, like turn his son into a robot and give him false memories of killing his younger sibling so he wouldn't go back to a Freddy's location, naming the new robot version Michael, for instance. Or by just going on even more of a killing spree, not caring about the consequences of his actions because what else does he have to lose? And if Crying Child does end up possessing the security logbook or even Golden Freddy, then that only goes to serve this point too. The Bite of 83 is a horrific but important moment. And for Happiest Day. The Happiest Day minigame from FNAF 3 was planned to be the end of the series. Scott said that the game was meant to be the last, but people were disappointed with the Springtrap jump scare, so he made FNAF 4. Which makes sense now, since it's pretty much an overcorrection. That's why those animatronics are so damn terrifying and horrific, and why FNAF 4 is listed as the end of the original FNAF story. The souls of the time of FNAF 3's release are in fact set free, hence the good and bad endings, but come FNAF 4 and more so sister location, Location, we learned that this isn't the case, since the remnant metal used to make the fun times is actually made of the remnant from the original five kids, which causes some interesting plot holes but could help explain a lot. Like the children's spirits could have been released, but the metal was still infused with their agony perhaps, allowing it to be more conductive for spirits, hence why Elizabeth possesses baby so quickly, or something along those lines maybe, I don't know. The horrific implications of the original ending to the series make this one of the most important FNAF lore moments especially if it had ended there. Imagine if it had. Imagine how simple the games would have been if it just ended in FNAF 3. And that was the ending. We let, we set the spirits free and that was it. We were good. Didn't work. <laughs> Getting close to the end of number 3, FNAF 6. FNAF 6 is another one of those ending sequences, where the series looks like it could have ended, and while slightly more convoluted, it would have been okay. We would have hammered out the rest eventually. The FNAF 6 ending, though, was indeed the end. The end of multiple animatronics. Elizabeth, Charlotte, and Ennard were all released in the FNAF fire, as well as Michael, who stays to burn, and Henry, who stayed so nobody would remember this place or this story. However, we know one escaped. Springtrap, or Scraptrap, William Afton himself, managing to evade death once again, and it wouldn't be until later where we found out and understood how, and yet we figured he would be back. He always comes back, and now, with nobody to stand against him, he's free to do whatever he wants. Henry isn't fighting him, Michael isn't fighting him, they both thought he would burn, but he's free, as, well, as free as he can be while being stuck inside a video game world. For now. And ultimately, in number two, The Man in Room 1280. While plenty of people brush these books off as just books, the story of The Man in Room 1280 is one of the most important pieces of lore we have gotten from this series. It answers a question that we've all had since FNAF 3. How does William keep surviving? How does he always come back? And while it may seem minuscule, this is the biggest hint that we've gotten in ages. Learning that William was possessed by the spirit of one of his victims explains more in the series than any Easter egg Scott had left us. I don't care that fun time Foxy can mimic voices, or how the scooper can inject a remnant. It mattered how William's signature line of I always come back is true, and this book delivered. It also explains how he came to possess a hard drive that got scanned into Help Wanted. It explains that since he was possessed, he was alive in FNAF 3, and that explains how he survived the fire in both FNAF 3 and FNAF 6. It showed us that everyone knows what he did despite not being convicted. It provided so much for us, and that makes it the most important piece of confirmed lore that we have. There is one moment that is more important, but we have nothing on it at the time of this recording. And that point is, finally, in a number one, the breaking point. 
The breaking point in the scenario is referring to the moment William started killing. We don't know when it was, we don't know why it was, to us it's just always been a thing. And I wouldn't be surprised if there was an incident before that of the missing children's from the first game that was just his first kill. We don't know what drove him into killing and there's no way that would have been the first, right? Nothing has been confirmed or even presented in the games. There are hypotheses that it was due to his wife or lover dying, perhaps due to childbirth, or that it was because one of his children died, but we know that can't be true unless he had another kid that we haven't seen, because he had designed animatronics to kill before his children died. There were really no indicators as to why he started on his mass killing spree. It could just be that he's insane and wanted to do it. Or maybe he wanted to unlock the mysteries of life, or maybe it was just an accident the first time, but then he got a taste for it. We don't know, and we don't even have any evidence to go off, so all of this is just hypothesis and guesswork. It can't even really be educated guesswork, because we don't know enough about Afton himself to make a real connection. Like, we don't understand him as a person, if you kind of get what I'm saying. We know parts of his story, but we don't know what's in his brain, and that's what we would need to make an educated guess, at least from the crime shows I've watched. 10 out of 10, don't run. What do you do if a group of bad guys is coming after you at a good pace and you have no way to defend yourself? You get the hell out of there faster than my dad trying to get milk, faster than William's wife left him, faster than me going outside when someone asks if I want to get Taco Bell. The fact that we're in this tiny office is pretty ridiculous when you think about it. Like, on Honestly, why would we stay in this room when we see on the security cameras that the animatronics aren't nearby? We can just like book it and be safe. Like why isn't there a one-way emergency exit out of our office if this is such a hazard? We stay in this room and that wouldn't happen in real life if you were in any sort of actual danger. In game Lab MatPat's old YouTube Red series, we saw him take on a real FNAF experience. However, when the animatronics were close, he didn't run away, he stayed in the office. Which could be used to say that since we consider that our safe space, we would do the same. But if our life was actually in danger, like mortal danger, we are gonna die danger, we would run like the wind and not work there for seven days before getting fired. They did nine animatronics. Now, ignoring the whole possession thing, since that still isn't real, I've seen no evidence of it, especially due to intense agony. The whole servos locking up so we need to let them roam free at night thing is complete and utter BS. Firstly, in a world where we can have shape shifting animatronics and discs that emit such high frequency sounds that they alter what we see. I'm supposed to believe that a servo motor is going to lock up. Secondly, why do they need to free roam in the first place? They just stand on a stage. A servo motor creates linear or circular motion, which is not the kind of movement the animatronics need. I mean, it could be, but if these are so complex that they can move on their own, why would they lock in the first place? Not to mention the whole, yeah, someone got bit on the head, so we're gonna stop making them roam around freely. Like, why would you do that in the first place? Or the fact that kids live literally tear Mangle to bits and then put her back together. Ironically, cause you know, put you back together. But still, it makes no sense. Before I continue on, can you do me a huge favor and hit that like button if you're enjoying the video or just the channel in general. And feel free to share this with a friend if you're so inclined. It really helps us out against the algorithm and lets us know what you want to see more of. And, and you know, helps me keep my job. Thank you. In a day, technology. Speaking of animatronics, what is up with the technology in this world? They're so advanced, but at the same time, they have the same tech that they would have in that era. The illusion discs are already crazy overpowered. Like, life is a perfectly balanced game with absolutely no exploits, but those things are absolutely nuts. And then there's the fun time animatronics, where Baby literally stores a claw in her stomach and can capture children, and their AI is so advanced that Ballora can talk, and she isn't really possessed unless we go off the FNAF novels, and even if we did, it's from five different kids, so they would just be gargling. And the animatronic's ability to free roam is incredible. They were doing this before they got possessed as well, so their AI is incredibly advanced. Yet for some reason, they don't have smartphones or better computers. Like NASA would be interested in the AI of these animatronics, so why is there other pieces of technology that are the same as they would normally be in that era? It makes no sense to me. And it's seven wall tiles. FNAF 3 is a trippy game to say the least. With multiple different endings and a load of puzzles along the way, the supposed to be final game of the series takes some weird turns. But I think the most egregious offense is the freaking goddamn wall tiles. Why do you have to dial in a phone number on some panels in the wall in order to set souls of dead kids free? Like, 
what? Where did that come from and why is nobody questioning this anymore? Like, the other games came out and we just forgot about this. Was it because the series was meant to be a dream but isn't anymore? Like, is it because William had left some weird security pad behind these tiles? Is it not real at all and we're just tripping balls? Because honestly, with the amount of hallucinations and fear we have, not to mention any sleep deprivation that could also be happening, it's entirely plausible that this just isn't real at all. And that these wall tiles, special minigames, and shadow Bonnie action figures we do see are just a result of multiple different issues. That or it's the reason William started killing. Because like, WTF. And it's 6 limited power. The original difficulty of this game comes from the fact that you have limited power, at least in FNAF 1. This adds stakes since you can't just keep your doors closed the whole time and you can't just keep the lights on outside. And it's explained to us, and just flat out told to us in the survival logbook, that the building has limited power after 12am. Why? That makes no sense. Absolutely none. Why would a building have restricted power after midnight? I've never heard of that before. And unless the franchise owner is extremely cheap and doesn't want more of an electricity bill, there would be no reason to set up a system that cuts you off. Plus, if that's the case, why risk a more costly lawsuit in that case if someone does get hurt or dies because of the limited power? Even if you won and didn't have to pay, you still have to pay the lawyer fees because by no means would any judge make someone who got injured at work pay for the company's fees. At least I'd hope not. Especially when the game takes place. Halfway through in number 5, FNAF AR. I've said it before and I will say it a million more times. Why is the company sending out animatronics that they know are dangerous? The whole point of FNAF AR is that the company is sending these animatronics to try and rebuild their reputation. Same thing with Help Wanted. But then they see that they're infected with a virus turning them hostile, but instead of recalling them like any normal company, they send out more animatronics, including multiple versions of the killer that caused them to lose their reputation in the first place. They did not think that it was just an old their Bonnie model and decided to call it Springtrap. If that was the case, it would be listed in AR as Old Bonnie or Spring Bonnie, not Springtrap. They know exactly what they're doing and nobody has called them out yet. Companies will get in trouble for making a freaking tiny mistake in their game, but this company can get away with just letting people die? That's sus as hell. Purple is sus. And if for business deals, the people behind the Fazbear Entertainment Company, whether it be some board of directors or William Afton, aren't the brightest bunch. The ideas are there, but they're not executed well. Why the living hell would hiring someone to make games about the tragedies that took place in your restaurants ever seem like a good idea? That shouldn't have worked in the slightest. The main concept of using a game to make fun of the deaths of kids is already pretty messed up. And while it seems to have worked in the FNAF universe, why did they ever try it? Those events now will never be lost in time. Those games are there forever. And if they're as popular as the games are in our world, there are people who made whole YouTube channels about the series. At least when YouTube comes out. When does YouTube come out in this world? Like I know one kid said MatPat's line in one of the Fazbear Frights books and then the book said as his favorite YouTuber says. But like, wh when did that story take place? After 2005 or was YouTube around earlier in this timeline? Because if it is, am I still the host on Top 10 Gaming? I kinda wanna be canon in FNAF 2. And a 3, business expansion. When a company undergoes a tragedy like 5 missing children, you can usually assume that they're either going under or will never be the same. This would go for any company, but especially a company directed at kids. Like if Chuck E. Cheese actually had this happen, nobody would be taking their kids there. But for some reason, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza has not only been able to keep their doors open, but make them bigger, opening an entire shopping mall based on their characters. What the, like, how the actual hell did this happen? From having to shut down at the end of basically every FNAF game, to opening an entire mall sized pizza plex that has even more opportunities for your kids to get lost in? What the ever loving crap happened to make that work? This has to be the most ridiculous form of logic in this series. I'm not even exaggerating. I don't care how many comments say that they would love a real FNAF, if it was actually real and there were actual deaths, you'd be scared crapless to go there. You wouldn't actually go unless you were an adult with no kids or a YouTuber trying to put together the mystery of what really happened and to see if their pizza is recycled. And ultimately, in a number two, investigation. Speaking of trying to find out what really happened, why didn't the cops? We know that there was an investigation thanks to the Midnight Motorist minigame from FNAF 6, but they never found the bodies, even though the animatronics smelt like death and were oozing mucus and blood. So much that they had to actually shut down according to the FNAF 1 news clippings. So what gives? 
Why did they close their investigation so quickly? Or why didn't they look into the suits when it was reported that they were leaking blood? I don't care if it's the 80s and the police don't have the tech they do now. If a place you were investigating missing people but found no bodies had something that is leaking blood, you go check that shit out. You don't just leave it behind and say, ah, that can't be related. Who the hell thinks like that? It's so disgusting to me. And honestly, even though it's a game that has to have a reason to continue, they should have done more. I get that if they had found the bodies, we wouldn't have gotten so many games, but sometimes it's quality over quantity. I guess they had to meet their arrest quota for the month or something, so they just dropped this case like it was cold. Finally, in at number one, doors! You knew this was going to be on the list. I hate the goddamn mother-loving doors in this game. Why do they open when the power is out? That makes no sense. Even if it's an electromagnet, like everyone keeps saying in the comments whenever I bring this up, those require power to turn on. So if anything, it would be costing power to keep the doors open rather than closed. Gravity doesn't work in reverse. If the magnet is off, the door would just fall down. I get that it's supposed to be for gameplay purposes, but what, what in this universe makes this make sense? There is no conceivable way that these doors should be working in that way, but they do. They do, and it makes me mad. W why do you do this to me? Sky Daddy Scott, why? I really want merch that says Sky Daddy Scott though, for real. That would be hilarious. Just like Scott's avatar on like a cloud. Yes. Number 10, Night 5 Phone Call. It's possible that the creepy phone call we get on Night 5 of FNAF 1 is just there to creep us out. And if that is its only meaning or purpose, I would say it does its job pretty well. But of course, that is never enough for us FNAF fans. We need it to mean something. Why does it happen? And why only on Night 5? Is there a hidden message somewhere in there? While many fans have broken down this recording, lots of theories claim that it's saying something different than other theories. It doesn't seem we've universally been able to agree on the words being said or the meaning behind them, if there really was any meaning at all. We still don't have a confirmed answer for this creepy call where it came from or what it's trying to tell us. Is it a demonic message? Are the children trying to reach out? Or is it just there to scare FNAF 1 players? And it really does mean nothing. Number 9 purple guy. So one of the unexplained parts of FNAF is something that I feel like we have been trying to justify for years, but that also might just be as simple as a game design explanation. This one, I guess, is sort of explained, but it's never been explicitly confirmed by Scott Cawthon, I don't believe. So because I feel like it's interesting and we don't know for sure for sure, I figured I'd include it here. In the mini games, William Afton appears as a purple guy. This became so synonymous with the character that one of his aliases even became purple guy. But why does he appear to be purple? Some claim this is because William Afton is an undead figure. He died, he rotted, turning purple, much like Michael did in Sister Location. He also looks purple in that game as well, in the mini games. If we even want to call those mini games, I don't know, the mini walking about. And so, because William Afton's corpse is all decomposed, that's how he appears. But what about in FNAF 3? We also see a mini game where he seems to be alive as we watch as he gets into the Springtrap suit, running from what we assume are the ghosts of his victims. Once in the suit, it's evident that the spring locks have malfunctioned, puncturing his body and killing him. So if he doesn't die till after, how could he be purple before? Why would he appear purple before his death in these games? Well, some have theorized it's to make the character stand out. A Redditor by the username of Stray Dogs actually suggested that it is actually because of the style of old Atari 2600 games. William Afton is actually a shadowy figure. Those old games usually only had a black backdrop. So for anything that was supposed to be shadowy, you would use purple or something to avoid it blending into the background. I think that's actually a pretty good explanation. So I know I said unexplained, but that one might be explained because I just think it makes sense. But let me know what you think. Is it rotting or is it old game styles or do you still feel like we don't have an answer for it yet? <laughs> and friends, before we move on to the next spot, just a quick reminder to give this video a thumbs up. If you love FNAF videos, make sure you show us you love them so we can make more content for you. Number eight, Ballora's Song. Something that continues to haunt me is Ballora's Song. Many fans believe that Ballora is a stand-in for William Afton's deceased or simply ex-wife who left him in some kind of permanent capacity, whether through death or just by choice. Ballora's Song that she sings 
seems to play into this theory very, very well. Ballora sings about wanting someone to come join her, someone who is secluded, seemingly in mourning, and who has no joy left in their life. The idea here is that Ballora is echoing the feelings of Afton's wife, who felt that William was lost to her because of his work, and possibly because of an accident that caused them to lose a child, also adding distance between them. Ballora sings, All I see is an empty room, no more joy, an empty tomb. It's so good to sing all day, to dance, to spin, to fly away. If Ballora was built to represent William's wife, who left him after the loss of a child, then these lyrics seem to make a lot of sense. However, we still have no real idea if Ballora is meant to represent Mrs. Afton, or if William was ever married at all. I'm still contemplating whether or not his children really are his biological children and not kids that he adopted, created, or potentially kidnapped. What do you think? Is Ballora meant to represent Mrs. Afton, or is she just another of William's twisted creations, meant to just creep us out? Number 7. Crying Child? Children? One thing we still aren't sure of is who exactly the crying child is. What's more, we have a few different crying children that pop up throughout the series. Usually when we talk about the crying child, we're talking about the character who appears in FNAF 4. But for the purpose of this point, what I'm actually curious about is your theories on the crying child or children who appear in the games previous to number 4. You can see hints of them in the games prior, but you'll definitely have spotted them in FNAF 3. There they show up prominently in mini games, including in the happiest day minigame where the crying child there must be given cake. Who are these crying children hinted at in previous games? Are all these appearances a cry back to THE crying child? Or are they all different children who just happen to all be miserable? Are they all victims? Ah! I have so many questions about everything. I'm like, this probably, but also we still don't know, so what's going on? Number 6, The End of Sister Location One of the endings for Sister Location, not the true ending, but still, shows us that despite us managing to survive the night and escape entered, if that's the ending you get, avoiding getting scooped, even when we make it safely home to watch our soaps, we're not truly safe. Instead, we are pursued by Ennard, who somehow manages to escape the facility without us, even though that was the whole point of needing to scoop us in the first place was to be able to escape, and also miraculously either finds a way to follow us home or find out somehow where we live. I guess they could have our address on file at Circus Babies Entertainment and Rental, but still, how did they get out? What? Number five, it's me. It's me is a phrase that pops up all over the place in FNAF 1 and is classified as being a hallucination. But what does it mean and where does it come from? There are a wide variety of theories on this subject, but many of them differ. One thing that many have in common is they believe the words it's me are coming from the animatronics, but whether the phrase is intended to be malicious, reassuring, or simply as some kind of plea for help from the spirits that haunt those animatronics remains to be decided on. What's more, these are just theories about the phrase. We still don't really have any definitive proof that tells us exactly what it's me is meant to refer to and why it shows up all over the place in FNAF 1, from Foxy sign here and there to background posters to simply appearing on your screen in accompaniment with either Freddy or Bonnie. That is, of course, if you get that glitch. Because it doesn't always show up, but it can. Number 4. Crying Child While many still believe the crying child is the protagonist of FNAF 4, we don't really know much about them, or if they truly are the protagonist we're meant to be playing as in that game. The crying child is often thought to be the third child of William Afton, but none of their appearances have ever explained who exactly they are, so we are still left even wondering if this is true. I also feel like we don't even really know for sure if they're the third child in terms of, like, the order of the siblings. I don't know, you can let me know if you feel like we have lots of evidence to prove something like that, but... I don't feel like we have enough evidence even for that yet. Most of what we know about them is based on theories we've all come up with to make sense of their importance and their existence. Why they have been so prominently featured as a character still remains to be seen. Are they actually in Afton? Is this some kind of red herring meant to mislead us? Could they somehow be Michael Afton at a younger age? Or could they somehow have some kind of tie there? Or perhaps William Afton, but younger? I don't think that makes sense with dates, but the dates that appear in the game really only make the mystery more confusing, as it's very hard for us to pinpoint a timeline in regards to the potential siblings' dates of birth and death, or just the dates of anything in general. It's very confusing. I'm confused. Are you confused? 
Number three, Shadow Bonnie and Golden Freddy. Why do Shadow Bonnie and Golden Freddy crash your game? This is a mystery that still seems unexplained. I guess we could just easily explain it away with the fact that antagonists in the game each simply have their own, like, thing that they do, their own way of punishing you, and this is Shadow Bonnie's and Golden Freddy's way of doing so. If you are not proactive enough, that is. Still, it seems very meta in comparison to some of the other punishments, as this punishment isn't something that happens to the character you're playing as in-game, like losing power, being unable to access your screens, doors getting, like, stuck open or closed and things like that. But instead, it's something that happens outside of the in-game environment, affecting you as a player, not you as a character in-game. So what does that mean? What does that mean? Does it mean anything? Number two, getting scooped. A strange moment in terms of what we see happen in-game versus what would really happen in real life can be experienced in Sister Location. In this game, at the end of your true story, your character, Eggs Benedict, who we believe to be Michael Afton, gets scooped. Ennard then wears your skin as a human disguise, allowing them to leave the Circus Baby and Entertainment rental facility. Afterwards, the protagonist rejects the insides of Ennard after outwardly rotting. Being that they have no guts and should be dead, this would, in theory, be the end of their story, because now they like literally have nothing inside them, they just upchucked it. They would crumble to the ground and finally be 100% dead. I mean, technically getting scooped should also make you 100% dead, but in either case, that's not what happens. Instead, you hear Circus Baby's voice reassuring you that you won't die, and we see good old Eggs Benny come back to life. How is this possible? We still have no idea. Though I would, once again, like to use this opportunity to assert my Afton's children are lifelike humanoid animatronics theory. Anyone? Anyone taking that theory? I think it's a pretty good theory. Number one, the murders. One of the greatest mysteries is also one of the most important ones, especially when it comes to understanding the most prominent character in the franchise. William Afton. The murders that he committed still baffle players. We also don't even really know if he committed all of the murders. Recently, there has been some doubt based on evidence found in the Fazbear Frights books as to whether or not he could actually have maybe an accomplice, possibly Vanny, and even more ridiculously, I don't know, possibly a time-traveling Vanny? I don't know. Why William Afton seeks to kill is still a huge unexplained question in the game, and one that is crazy, crazy important, because it would also help to explain ideally so many other things that William has done. The murderous events that have been referred to in the lore, and the why behind them remains one of the most puzzling and most important mysteries the FNAF has given us.